This listening piece is about why interpretation matters. The Navy's Black Captain, John Perkins. Hi, I'm Ellie Aikibi. I'm a freelancer and I've recently been recording podcasts on people of historical note. This is a quote by eminent historian of the Navy, William Laird Clues, writing in 1903. This John Perkins was a gallant but very extraordinary character, a lieutenant of 1782, a commander of 1797, and a captain of 1800. He is supposed by a writer of the nautical magazine who knew him to have been illegitimate by birth and to have had Negro blood in his veins. He could only write to the extent of signing his name mechanically, and he served almost exclusively in the West Indies, where, when on half pay, he lived with little regard to the decencies of civilization. My name is Nick Ball, and I work at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. John Perkins was born in Jamaica sometime before 1750, most likely to an enslaved mother and a white father. He became an enslaved servant to William Young, a carpenter in the naval service, and joined HMS Granado in 1759. After Perkins left the service of William Young, he worked as a pilot manoeuvring ships in and out of ports before securing his first command of the private schooner Punch. In 1782, the Royal Navy gave Perkins command of the sloop Endeavour, and they used his vast knowledge of local waters and his knowledge of French and Creole to gather intelligence on the French Navy. By 1800, he was made post-captain of the 24-gun HMS Arab with a crew of 155 men, making him the first black man to be given that rank. In 1802, he commanded the large HMS Tartar with 264 men. He wrote to the Admiralty requesting another ship, but Tartar was to be his last command. Perkins retired to Jamaica in 1805, where he bought an estate and owned slaves, very much taking on the role of a white colonial gentleman of the period. He died in 1812. Perkins' obituary in the Naval Chronicle described his actions. He annoyed the enemy more than any other officer by his repeated feats of gallantry and the immense number of prizes he took. Okay, so who was John Perkins? I think the fact that it says um, his identity is so uh, up for question about whether he was black, whether he was mixed. I think that sort of says a lot about how racialized politics are today, where they're so definitive. But I think at the time of his birth, you probably just had like free, slave, indentured, and the racial dynamics weren't as pinned down. That's definitely what I get from the questions about him. Yeah, I think that very little is known about his his early childhood and who his mother or father were. Um, and I think that says something about the relationship, the possible, I mean, we can only speculate about the possible relationship between his mother and father and the dynamics of that colonial period on the plantations. Mm. Um, but I think the fact that we don't know very much about his early life says something about that. And he joined the Navy in in, in, in 1759, but he, he joined as an enslaved servant to the ship's yeah. carpenter, William Young. Perkins wouldn't have had much choice about that. Yeah. Um, but in joining the Navy, he was able to learn skills and in the end it became a kind of route to freedom. So it's really interesting how Perkins' personal narrative goes from him and sort of plotting out or mapping out this sort of uncertain route to freedom. But at the same time, it's within this wider context of the Royal Navy and what it means um, to the Caribbean and to um, people with African identity. So it's Perkins having his own map to freedom through the Navy, but within this wider context of what the Navy means to his uh, wider identity as a formerly enslaved person himself. So I think it's important to uh, think about Perkins' in and out narrative as a black man trying to plot his way to what freedom looks like, and then also the wider narrative of what the Royal Navy meant to that region. 
So in some recent research, it says the Royal Navy's principal roles in the region were to provide security for the slave colonies and to protect British merchant shipping carrying, amongst other things, slave-grown commodities as well as enslaved Africans themselves. In this sense, the Navy was integral to the maintenance of Britain's enslaved empire. It wasn't unusual for um, black people, both free and enslaved, to be involved in, in a range of economic activities um, as pilots, um, fishermen and trading, as well as crew on Royal Navy ships. I think one thing that is definitely highlighted from um, the nature of Perkins' career is how unclear the path to freedom was for um, an enslaved person. It wasn't really clear on how you get from um, being an apprentice and giving someone your wages or being an actual enslaved person where you're not being paid at all to being a fully autonomous person. And I think that probably did affect um, how Perkins saw his role um, yeah. as a black person within the Navy, knowing that the Navy was helping to um, keep the slave trade going. But if he put his um, freedom as the priority, that probably wouldn't have been at the forefront of his mind. Yeah, I think that's um, really important um, to note because um, even though, as we've seen, um, Perkins was able to rise through the Navy and, and gain his freedom um, using his own skills in a what is actually, for the time, a, a very, very um, meritocratic situation, but the overall context the sort of global and regional context is that it was a still a, a slave um an, an economy built on on slavery so not only did um perkins not only was he able to rise up through the ranks of the navy using his skills but actually the navy recognized that there was an, another important factor about him um that could be used and that was his race uh, the fact that he was black or at least mixed race, he was able to um, be, blend in in, in um, Saint Dominique in the French colony of Saint Dominique uh, to gather information. And in 1792, he was arrested there, uh, where it was alleged that he was supplying the black slave population with arms and helping them overthrow their white rulers. And uh, he was obviously very um, important to the navy because they sent two ships to rescue him. And in fact, they sent him out again. Uh, this time, um, it was back to the French colony and the slave rebellion was successful. Perkins wrote to the Admiral about the situation in Haiti. I assure you that it is horrid to view the streets in different places stained with the blood of these unfortunate people whose bodies are now left exposed to view by the river and seaside. We came to our anchor, several bodies got entangled in it. In fact, such scenes of cruelty and devastation have been committed as is impossible to imagine or my pen describe. So that's really interesting because um, even though he's sent out there to sort of supply and arm the um, revolution, the Haitian revolution, um, when he's writing to the Admiral about the situation in Haiti, um, the second time he goes, he's sort of describing um, his own um, conflicted feelings with uh, empathising with uh, the massacred white slave owners. So I think it's really interesting that um, John Perkins has had like this really rare career of going from an enslaved person um, to the captain of ships. And even with like the complexities, complexities of his racial identity, the wider context of what the Navy, the Royal Navy would have meant to him, that he is, it's not reflected in that quote by um, William um, Clues 
in 1903, where it's almost like his racial identity becomes really central and becomes almost a reason to downplay his achievements within the Navy. Um, for all that he sort of did and the sort of sacrifices that I can imagine, that I can sort of speculate that he would have had to make to um, his black, the black side of his identity in order to fulfill his Navy, uh, his Royal Navy career. And then for his black identity to sort of become uh, an integral part of um, undermining it is really yeah. important. Led Clues gets his, um, he gets the basic facts of when Perkins was promoted. Mm. He gets those right, but then he basically stereotypes about all the other unknowns. Mm. So, for example, the bit where he says he lived with little regard to the decencies of civilization. Mm. And obviously, we know that Perkins bought an estate in Jamaica and lived as a sort of gentleman of the time. Mm. So, it's, it's, um, for me, I think it's that interesting sort of intersection on in his life, he was trying to, I think freedom for him looked like um, a sort of white colonial gentleman. So you own an estate, you have slaves and that, and that sort of um, power was freedom. And that's how he lived once he had retired. But in writing about him and his career, all of that was erased because he had, as um, to, to quote, um, Negro blood in his veins. That that sort of almost undid everything. Um, yeah, that and he actually, had achieved. Yeah, and actually, the point which um, probably had a big impact on Perkins' rise through the ranks was his his uh, knowledge and you know skills in language and the local area. We've seen that he's written letters, even though. Laird Clues just, just describes him as writing to the extent of signing his name mechanically. So in my mind, the question is, what does Perkins mean today? And the questions over his um, racial identity, was he black, was he mixed race, are still very relevant to, to present day. But also that bigger question of being black and in a system that is not always about the freedom for people that look like you and being complicit in it, but at the same time, being part of that system or working in it can somehow help you map a path to freedom. And then there's also the question of what does freedom look like to a black person? So I think Perkins, to me, his relevance today is really in how we look at society's effect on black identity globally and also in relation to Britain. <laughs>